event and also in California with the Briggs Initiative the following year which attempted unsuccessfully to deny uh, uh, lesbian and gay teachers uh, the right to, to work. Um, so I think there was a kind of a certain political cynicism afoot which saw this as a very successful uh, uh, discourse. Um, uh, do you have any other uh, thoughts on this, Erin? Um, um, well, one, one of the things that I know um, was discussed at, at the time was because of, of um, you know, the rise of a, of a feminist uh, discourse at all, generally, that there was an, uh, there was a, an acknowledgement that um, women's lives unfolded very, very differently, and uh, tended to, you know, there, there was a critique of, of women's lives being subsumed under, under, you know, sort of the male version or the human, the, the human version of things. And I think there were some interesting discussions of how intergenerational sex was a very different experience for young girls than it would have been for young boys. Um, the the relationship between an older man and a young boy had the, perhaps more the, the promise of an introduction to the male world of, of culture and power that no male could offer a young, young girl. And just in, in terms of the way we thought about sexual roles and so forth. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I wonder, I mean, it, there, I don't think this discourse should have disappeared in quite this way, and it took its toll on the gay and lesbian world in a, in a very harsh way. And as you say, I think it still does to, today. Um, but I do see another aspect to it, which was the acknowledgement that, uh, uh, that of, of the power relationships uh, between adults and, mm -hmm. and, and kids being mirrored in some way between men and women and so forth. So I just was very... It was no, very I think that's very insightful. Uh, and if you look at a film like Pretty Baby from, I think, 79 or 80, in comparison to this, which is about Brooke Shields as a 12-year-old prostitute or 15-year-old prostitute, I'm not 12. sure. 12. 12. Uh, it was treated, it was uh, received very, very differently from films that were about same-sex male um, intergenerational sex. The new right, when it raised the specter of abuse, focused disproportionately, almost entirely on same-sex male intergenerational sexuality, as if uh, the problem of abuse was entirely a homosexual issue, which of course it was not and is not. So, so of course gender and power are, are very crucial dynamics in this whole, in this whole landscape. And, uh, this film, with its sort of nasty uh, moments of, of uh, misogyny on the part of some of the characters, I think is touching on that nerve in a certain way. I mean, the, 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 uh, it's interesting that on the director's commentary track on, on the new DVD, they're sort of cringing about that scene where Bozo harasses the teeny bopper hitchhikers and uh, almost considered removing it from the new version. Fortunately, they, they, they kept it in. Any other questions? Yes. How, how would you explain a film like Harold Law and Louis Francis and anyone was, had become such a classic and it's the gap between all the characters uh, is far wider and it, it's also very explicit. There's like, there's bad scenes, there's like a lot more things that happen and it becomes a classic and a film like this which everything is kind of open just goes into the depths of the film archives. I think it's about Canadian, Canadian cinema. <laughs> <laughs> and Louis Mal was a very respected um, a, a European auteur uh, with uh, the muscle of Hollywood and the muscle of uh, international distributors behind him and uh, Brooke Shields as a star I mean, uh, uh, I, I think I think that's a very important So it's more about the market rather 
It's about the market, it's also about this gender power uh, distinction. I think it's much, it's very hard to generalize because Death in Venice was such a huge hit, but then Death in Venice was also susceptible to a very abstract reading, although I don't buy that reading, but I think it's also the fact that Pretty Baby was a heterosexual story um, that, that made it such an important uh, uh, film in the market. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear you part. You you talked about Harold and Maude? Yeah, but, okay. it's, but it, your response is interesting. In, in <laughs> okay. In point of view, because I think a lot of it's classic. But I think the biggest difference with Harold and Maude is, is close to what Eric was saying. It, I don't think it was taken terribly seriously because you have an old lady mm -hmm. and a young man. Right. And that power and have a scene. Right. Each other. Has everyone seen Harold Maude? Uh, yeah. Ruth Gordon as an 80-year-old and I forget his name. He wasn't really a youth though. He was. 20, or wasn't the character? Yeah. 20 or 21. So 20 or 21, but it's still an intergenerational romance that has. Yeah, that's exactly contemporaneous to uh, Montreal, Maine, isn't it? And it was a huge hit, a sleeper hit. So it's a very, very interesting comparison. And also, if you look at Fassbinder's film about the relationship in the same year, I think relationship between a young man in his 20s and a 65-year-old uh, cleaning woman. Does everyone know that film, uh, Angst mm -hmm. Essen Stehler Auf? It's yeah. called Bali in English, I think. But that also goes like inter, uh, racial. interracial. Interracial. was far more important than that, the intergenerational. Right, right. I mean, more in the German context. Right. Racism. So there's lots of very interesting contextual stuff going on. Yes, the I'm from Montreal and I'm French Canadian, and uh, you know, when I said anymore, I was 24 years old, I was going to see a lot of films from Quebec French producers. And this film, never, I never saw it, I never heard about it. Uh, how was, uh, what the, the press did uh, at that time, the Gazette or whatever, the English newspapers or... It had a brief commercial run. Theatrical run in Montreal, and it was reviewed in Cinema Quebec and Le Devoir. And um, Michel Ouvra, the critic of Cinema Quebec, said it was full of virtuality inexplore, um, a lot of potential. But uh, it didn't. It didn't catch on. I don't believe it was released in a French subtitled version. Uh, you can really feel the two solitudes in this film. For much of the film, you have no sense that you're in a, a French-speaking society, uh, do you? Until you, you, you come to uh, uh, the auction in La Chute, uh, you get a little bit of a sense of the, the uh, Francophone Quebecois uh, cultural environment, but not very much. Did you see Les Tien Fois, Don? Yes, yes, I met them at that time. I'm glad you like it. It's one of my favorites, too. Yes? Uh, thanks. Um, there was a character in the film who spoke compulsively. I forget what his character's name was or the actor. I mean, he's a... So the, the motor mouth guy? Yeah, the motor mouth guy. Stephen Lack, yeah? Stephen Lack, okay. Um, it's interesting. Uh, the film's kind of impacted, it seems, around intergenerational sex. Like, does it actually have a lot to say? Yeah, it's interesting that there is this conversation going on and that the two most explicitly gay characters in the film are involved in this uh, conversation about Johnny's agency and Johnny's autonomy. Mm -hmm. I don't think it re is resolved, but the conversation is registered. Uh, um, uh, and, and it, it, yeah, and they seem to be... Frank and both of them don't really talk that much about that issue. I mean, this film is very 70s in the sense that everyone's talking about relationships, but Frank and Bozo aren't very good at it, are they? Uh, 